Now, before we begin exploring uh, polar conics, we want to talk a little bit about the relationship between uh, the various dimensions of a traditional conic and a value called the eccentricity. Now, the eccentricity is essentially a measure of how, uh, let's say, distorted a conic curve is. Uh, if it has no eccentricity, it's actually a circle. And if it has the largest possible eccentricity, then it becomes a hyperbola. And essentially, tradi in traditional coordinate systems, in the rectangular coordinate system, we define the eccentricity as the relationship between the distance to the focus and the distance to the vertex. So in a circle, the distance to the focus is actually zero because the focus and the center are actually the same thing. And the distance to the curve of the vertex is just the radius. And so zero divided by any value is going to give you an eccentricity of zero. So um, circles have no eccentricity at all. Now, an ellipse is going to have some eccentricity, but in an ellipse, A is greater than C. Recall that for an ellipse, B squared plus C squared is equal to A squared, which ensures that a squared is always the largest value. So the distance to the major axis along that major axis is going to be longer than the distance to the focus. And so the re relationship that you're gonna get for an ellipse is going to be uh, an ex eccentricity between zero and one. So some sort of a fraction. For a parabola, the vertex and the focus um, are basically the same thing and so C and A are the same value. This gives a parabola the eccentricity of one, exactly one. And then if it's larger than that, if it's larger than one, in a hyperbola, A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared, the distance to the focus is further away than the distance to the vertex. And so the hyperbola has an eccentricity of greater than one. This is all very important in uh, astronomy in particular, uh, the less eccentric an orbit is, the more circular it is. As long as the eccentricity is less than one, then it has a closed orbit. If the eccentricity is one or larger, then it has a, an open orbit, and essentially it's on a trajectory to be flung out of the solar system, for example. Now, let's go to some graphs and let's remind ourselves what our conics look like in traditional form and what the various parameters do as we adjust them. So here we are on Desmos, and I've started with a circle and an ellipse as our two examples. The circle here has a radius that can be adjusted by this r squared value until it's negative, in which case there's no circle anymore. But the larger the radius, the larger the circle. But both dimensions uh, change at the same rate of speed. So the they're always symmetric with respect to each other. Now, in an ellipse, when both A and B are exactly the same value, then you also get a circle. But if you adjust one more than the other, then the dimension that is larger is going to stretch out the ellipse longer, and that's going to turn it into this um, extended uh, ellipse. If you extend the other one, longer than that, then it will extend longer in the y direction. And so you can see that, again, it has a zero eccentricity when these dimensions are exactly the same. But as you start adjusting them, it goes upward from zero. And if you can make these dimensions essentially infinite, then the graph converts in theory in the limit to a parabola. Now let's look at the difference uh, when we slip over from a parabola to a hyperbola. Take those off the graph and we'll start with our parabolas. So our parabolas here, um, they look like extending upward or extending to the right if the p-value is positive. Again, that's equivalent to our A value. 
And if they become negative, then they flip over to the opposite side of the graph. But these parabolas are always going to have an eccentricity of one because the, um, uh, the vertex and the focus always have the same distance from each other. Now, if we convert these over to our hyperbolas, we have our two hyperbolas here. And if we adjust the A and B values, what happens again is they become more narrow as the values become smaller. They become more closely centered if they're both more similar to each other. And then they become wider and more flat as one of the values gets, the negative value gets larger than the positive value. So these are our hyperbolas. And the hyperbolas, again, have an eccentricity larger than or equal to one, uh, larger than, strictly larger than one. Now, if we want to think about these in terms of the um, conics in polar form, we have to think about what conics look like in polar form. Now, the general rule for polar conics is that they have this general shape. All of them have the same shape. We don't have to worry about one of them being linear in the parabola. We don't have to worry about um, the ellipse and the hyperbola changing sign or anything like that. Um, changing the sign here is going to change the orientation from either left to right or top to bottom. Um, and the cosine and the sine are going to indicate whether they're left, right, or top, bottom. So uh, that they, but every conic is going to look exactly the same way in this form. Now, what's going to be different is the value of the coefficient of the trig function. Now, uh, in order to find the eccentricity, we need this constant in the denominator to be equal to one. So when we're trying to find the eccentricity, if this constant is not one, then we have to divide out um, from both the numerator and the denominator that one. Um, back, factor it out if you can, uh, move it around, but you need this constant to be one, and then the coefficient of the trig functions is going to be the eccentricity. And what we can do is we can go to a graph and we can experiment with different values of these uh, eccentricities to confirm that we're going to get these examples. Now, I will say that the, um, the circle uh, is a little bit of a, um, there's more than one way to get a circle in polar coordinates and polar conics. You can have R equals a constant. So if you indeed set E equal to zero, the trig function will disappear. You'll get a constant over one, you will get a circle. Uh, but there are other ways to get circles um, where the trig function is not in the denominator. So just as a reminder, R equals a constant is a circle, but also R equals um, a constant, let's say, times a trig function. So these don't look anything at all like the other conics, and they're a little bit exceptional in um, polar form, but all the other conics will consistently have this appearance. So let's go to our polar grapher and look at some examples. So I put some examples in here that we can click on and adjust the coefficients for. So in this example, um, I have a parabola I have my function here is essentially just one plus cosine theta. So the coefficient of the trig function is in fact one. The constant out front is one. And so this is a parabola. If I were to go ahead and change this, for example, to a sine, you could see that that changes the orientation. Um, this one's gonna open down instead of to the left. If I change this sign,
then the conic is going to flip upside down. And again, I can go back to my original cosine and that's gonna flip over in the other direction. But in each one of these examples, the uh, this curve is a parabola. Now, if I wanna change the location of the center, then I can change this constant up top. And you can see that's going to adjust the shape of the curve a little bit. It's going to adjust the position of the vertex. And that's a little bit more complicated than just finding the eccentricity. And so I'm gonna leave that for another day. If we look at this example, the coefficient of our trig function in this case is three. And so we end up with this hyperbola. And again, I can adjust this to make it two. And I still have a hyperbola and I can adjust it to make it, let's say 1.1. And this is actually still a hyperbola. Maybe it needs to be a little bit bigger so we can see both ends of it. There we go. There's both halves of it. And again, you can adjust this downward. The two halves do get further apart. So as you get closer and closer to one, you will get closer and closer, more similar to a parabola. And then the two ends will be very far apart. They will be quite far off the graph, in fact. But that will, again, adjust the parabola and of the hyperbola, the exact dimensions of it. And of course, to change the orientation, we can change the sign to a cosine and now it is oriented side to side instead of in the center. And again, we can adjust the exact center of our hyperbola. Changing that coefficient up top is going to adjust the center position. And I will again, leave that for the exact details of how that works for another day. And then finally, if we want to look at an ellipse, the coefficient of an ellipse here is one third uh, of the cosine function. And so this, you can see it is elliptical. And if I want to adjust this, uh, if I have a larger fraction, it will become more elliptical. That was one over 23, not one half. Um, so it'll become more elliptical as this fraction gets closer to one. So if I went two thirds or four fifths becomes more elliptical. Again, the sign will flip the orientation uh, from more this way to more that way. Again, we can adjust the center by adjusting the numerator. And I can make it more circular by making the coefficient even smaller. And the, the smaller it is, the closer to the center it will be and the more circular the graph will be. So these are our polar coordinates in conics. And again, the idea here is that in the denominator we make the uh, constant in the denominator equal to one. And then the coefficient that remains in front of the trig function is our eccentricity. And we can look at the two ways that we can get circles, either as just a constant, or we can just have a trig function And then the coefficient essentially tells you how far off the origin. Again, the center is someplace in the middle here. It's halfway down this distance. But both of these are circles, and both of these would qualify as being eccentricity zero.